So, Jacinta, my first question is, what does ambition mean to you? It is setting a goal that's very specific for your own needs. And I think it changes over time. So for me, ambition is a combination of what I want to achieve with my career, but also where and how I want to achieve that. So for me, it's very much around probably milestones rather than one huge climb of Mount Everest at the end. It's sequential. I'm a Virgo, so I like to make a list and check the boxes as I get along that path of ambition. And I noticed you said that it's career related. Do you feel ambitious in other aspects of your life? I'm ambitious in other aspects as well and would like to think I'm not defined by my career. I think how you approach your career and the other things that you engage in do define you. So ultimately, or what you're doing for paid employment is a piece of that. But for me, my ambition has always been around ways that I can get involved in things and opportunities to give back. So going back to when I was in my 20s, I got involved in netball administration in New Zealand. I ended up being on the board of Netball New Zealand for a number of years. Through my work, I got the opportunities to expand or share what I was doing with other organizations. So I've always felt that ambition is kind of the melting pot of everything that you bring to the table, not just how you're defined by whatever is on your business card. So that's interesting. When you say that it changes over time, can you talk a little bit about how what you've directed your ambitious urges towards has evolved throughout your life? Because that's an interesting comment about it not being something that's static. So I think when you start out, your ambition, and I'm going to say postgraduate, right? So you're in your 20s, you're sort of starting your career. Your ambition at that point is tied in, I think, to what your lifestyle aspirations are. So you might want to travel for the first couple of years, um, but ultimately you have a goal to get back to live in New Zealand or wherever it is and to get on a steady path to professional development as you move beyond that and not everybody makes that choice of course as you get beyond that and you feel comfortable in your professional standing or recognition you start to sort of widen your horizon on what ambition might mean. And some of that's driven by what you're free to do at that point, either economically or in terms of where you live or what your lifestyle is or your family circumstances. So I think that ambition kind of follows the seven ages of man, as Shakespeare would say. It does shift as your circumstances shift. And I think it is quite situational. But I think ultimately, for me, if I think about where I am today compared to where I was 40 years ago, I'm not too much different in terms of my ambition. I've done a variety of things throughout that course, but I think they haven't changed radically. You know, the pathway has still been pretty clearly set along the way. One of the founding fathers of ambition research is a a man called Gilbert Brim, who was the child of someone who grew up, you know, on basically farmland and his dad became a Harvard professor and then was, you know, forced to retire at 60 because in those days that's how it was. Yep. He very much describes ambition as circumstance specific. And I loved how he talked about his dad and, you know, and how he'd gone from, you know, being a farm boy to being a Harvard professor. And then he traced the end of his dad's life. And at the very end of his life, Um, His dad was, you know, 103 and blind and sitting on his porch and sharpening his tools and using his fingers to see if the plants in his window boxes needed water. And I love that idea that he expressed of ambition being something that is whatever you pointed at, it's something just outside your reach, something that stretches you. How that is constrained depends on where you're at and, you know, where your life is at. So it's lovely to have that reflected from someone with a different life experience. It also goes back to uh, what I talked about before. I think that things do tend to come full circle. Right? So if I think about you know, where I started my life in Invercargill growing up in Southland, you know, very much a, a local community-oriented family, each step that I made 
kept some of my past with me. So I don't feel like I've ever sort of just sliced the ribbon and said, I'm, I'm no longer part of this. For me, it's really important that whatever you're heading towards, bring some of your past with you. So my ambition for the next phase of my life is to own a vineyard somewhere in central Otago and sit watching the sunset and make sure I have enough guest accommodation for all my friends who have told me I need to be the hostess of the lodge for our retirement fun parties. <laughs> Do you view ambition the way you do because of the person you were when you were born or how you were raised as a child? Do you see the way you approach this as coming from any particular place? It is nature and nurture. I'm an oldest child, so you're always going to be the first to do something in the family. I grew up with a very large extended family, a lot of cousins and aunts and uncles living nearby. So I had people I looked up to, my older cousins I looked up to, my aunts and uncles and my parents particularly. And the things that they did were always kind of grounded in a sense of community and a sense of giving. I grew up and I am still an active Catholic. And I think my faith helps ground me when it comes to deciding if something's the right thing to do. So if I were to ask you who is the most ambitious person that you know, what kind of people and characteristics do you think of when I say most ambitious? I think of my group of girlfriends or my gang, as my daughter calls them. We all met at Otago, or if we didn't meet at Otago, the people who have become part of our group, our little nucleus since then, have very similar interests or personalities. and. We were a ragtag mob in many ways, but each of us in our own right, I think, has been on a very ambitious pathway without ever giving up what made her special along the way. We probably always encourage each other without ever putting a tag on it. So if I think about when we sit around in a group, which is typically when we can manage it at a World Netball Champ somewhere in the world, <laughs> no one kind of takes stock of who's done what in terms of achievements, but you just kind of feel very comfortable that everyone's in a place they wanted to be in. To me, that's ambition with a small a rather than ambition with a large a. And I think for women, perhaps more than men, Ambition is very much a, you know, it's a yin and a yang. You tend to, to want to keep everything balanced. You, you won't sacrifice one thing in order to achieve one other goal that you have. I look at ambition in my daughters and it's not dissimilar to my own, but it's probably much less structured and organized than what mine was. And that's probably reflective of how they've grown up and the opportunities that they've had along the way too. That's again really interesting because what often comes up when we discuss that external ambition is people often surface kind of traditional male models of ambition at that point. It's truly lovely to hear a collective supportive story of female ambition in response to that question. When we first moved to the States 21 years ago, our oldest daughter came home from school. She was in third grade at the time. And she was quite indignant because no one would believe that in the country she came from, at that time we had a female prime minister, a female leader of the opposition, female attorney general, and a female governor general, I believe. Yeah, Dame Kath, tis it. So... For her, the norm was women would be in leadership roles in the same way men were. It wasn't or one or the other. It was just quite normal. And in her view, nobody in her class, including the teachers, believed that that was possible at that time. <laughs> Is there anything that would enable you to be more ambitious? To feel confident, to be ambitious about something, there's a few things that I like to have locked in. The first is... Do I feel like I'm qualified to go after whatever it is I'm going after from a professional, from an academic point of view? But I also think it's about credibility. Have I done enough to make my mark, to really put my name forward or whatever it might be? 
qualification is definitely a critical piece for me of being ambitious. The second, I think, is circumstance. What else is going on that might make me choose to go now or go later? Whether it's around health, whether it's around family, where you're living at the time, that's one of the things that you want to have lined up so that you could do things. I kind of happened into working in a consulting practice, which ultimately was acquired by Grant Thornton three years ago. So I'm doing some things that I weren't on my radar at all and weren't necessarily actually, I would say, in my ambition bucket, but they've turned out very well for me. So that third pillar for me is being opportunistic. Does the good outweigh the bad if you're going to try something? That's the clearest articulation of that delicate dance that we do as women between feeling we're ready, balancing all the competing demands on our time and also being willing to take a punt that I've heard in a long, long time. All of those things resonate. (laughs) As you were speaking, I was thinking of occasions in my own life where I've been prepared to stretch on one of those dimensions. What's interesting to me is through COVID, and particularly if you start reading a lot of what's in the media, I would say in the last two months is the US has started to open up a bit again, is a lot of people have come to the conclusion they don't need to be perfect. And actually, if they didn't turn on their camera in a Teams meeting, didn't matter that much. And it's okay. You haven't destroyed your career by doing that. Perhaps an upside of this terrible pandemic is that people are willing to try something without it being fully baked or fully perfect before they do it. Because what have you got to lose? (laughs) I think that's something that a lot of the people I've interviewed have expressed in relation to leaving New Zealand as well. Yep. Yep. When you go somewhere where not everyone knows you and not everyone knows your entire whakapapa and your entire whanau and knows where you've been and your predicted future, because that's what it's like for some of us from regional New Zealand. Like There's an entire path sketched out for us. You go to somewhere else and nobody knows you, doesn't know the name of the school that you went to. And suddenly taking a chance on something that might not work out well feels much less risky and it's much more liberating. I have a good friend who's a professor at UC Berkeley, Homer Barami. She talks about the fact that in America, people have short memories. So if you do something and fail, it's not going to damn you for the rest of your life or the rest of your career. You get back up and try something else. And your short memories are good and bad. My daughter's soccer coach used to say the same thing. You know, when they lost a game, have a short memory. Forget it by the time you start the next game. Yeah, yeah, so I yeah. think there's some merit. But I also think the trade-off to that is feeling affiliated. When I go back to Invercargill, my expectation is even 40 years yeah. after I've ever lived full-time at home, I'll recognize someone in the street. Someone might recognize me or tell me I look like my mother or whatever it might be, but you're much more open to threads from your past. Whereas when you leave the country, your radar changes, right? You're not expecting someone to say, I know you as you walk down the street or as you walk down the street of Manhattan. You shift how you position yourself, how you view yourself when you're out in public. (laughs) Are there any other differences that you've noticed from your time out of New Zealand and your time in New Zealand in terms of how people view ambition? One of the things that caught my attention, and it's sheer population, but it's also about how organisations function in a country as large as this. I had a senior HR role when we lived in New Zealand. I came here and First of all, I wasn't able to work for those first few years because I was on a trailing spouse visa. And when I felt that I wanted to be doing something again, when I looked at the senior HR roles here, I couldn't have imagined myself doing one of them because I think they're much more perfunctory. They're much more siloed than what we have the opportunity to do in business in New Zealand. So I think the difference as you go into a bigger pond (laughs) right you're catching smaller fish often there's just more of them in the pond whereas I think in New Zealand you have more flexibility around how you would 
craft your own role, how you would position yourself and how you can make a contribution. Here, I think things are certainly in my experience, more structured or more linear and not necessarily as exciting. On the other side of the coin, of course, there's just so many more opportunities. And again, if I think about it from a professional point of view, just the kinds of businesses, the the kinds of careers that people can follow, you could wake up and decide you could do anything. And as long as you can get access to the right qualifications or the right opportunity to get the qualification, you can probably give it a go. But I think people have less loyalty or less affiliation to what they start with here compared to certainly where I came out of in New Zealand. I have friends who've worked in the same organization for over 30 years now, and they're still stimulated by getting up and going to work, doing whatever it was they were doing to contribute to that organization. In the US, people, unless they're truly lifers in a company, it's not unusual for them to be moving on after three or four years each time. I've been trying to explain to myself why it was that when I had the opportunity to work here, I still chose to do my consulting projects in New Zealand. The story I had been telling myself was that it was around what was interesting, but actually I think hearing you express that, a lot of it's around autonomy. Yes. And a desire to shape things. I watch how things are with John's work and I see the contribution he's making, but it's within very clear boundaries. Yep. I like to free draw a bit more than I like to colour in. Maybe I put it that way. (laughs) The ability to design a project like this. I've had US friends talk to me about how I could take this and I could apply this and you could do this in the US and you could turn it into a startup. And suddenly the whole thing's looking a whole lot less attractive. (laughs) Vastly more remunerative, but a lot less attractive. Or or satisfying, right? Yeah. Look, I tell you, one of my favourite corporate warrior stories is when our first daughter was born, in fact, when all three daughters were born, I was working for Fletcher Challenge, as it was in those days. And my boss was John Hart. And so I was on parental leave for nine months, first time around, and went in to visit John because I continued, I was a trustee of the Fletcher Challenge Trust, so I was just going in to sign some papers. And Rebecca was probably eight weeks old. John had called to see how he was doing. He asked if I could come in sometime and sign papers, as you did back in those days. And I said, I certainly could. I just need to work out if somebody could look after her. He said, oh, bring her with you. So I bought my little baby, which, of course, had everybody running to the little car carrier, left her at the at the office with John's admin, who was absolutely wonderful. And then we're sort of halfway through our conversation and I could hear the baby crying. I thought, oh no. And John just went, you might want to give her a feed and then we'll just continue this conversation when you're done. And it was a perfectly natural thing for him to say. Now, I know at that time it was probably not necessarily the norm in all of New Zealand businesses, But I could never imagine something like that happening in the organizations that I've seen the inside of in the U.S. in the last 20 years. I had an upstairs neighbor who had just had a baby when we arrived in New York for the first time. And she was incredibly excited. She was working as a designer for Martha Stewart and she had negotiated flexible working arrangements. And that meant she lost all her benefits did five days a week and four days but she was allowed to be at home one day a week and she was just beside herself with excitement because (laughs) this was just so incredibly generous and I'd come from the UK where I'd had six months paid maternity leave with my first two and with the second one had been called in to do a project much as you describe we're desperate we need a safe pair of hands on this you can bring the baby yep Um, You know, if you need to be in the office, you can bring the baby. And of course, Shanna at that point was five months old and she chose the first day that we went into the office in person to start crawling. (laughs) The baby like literally crawls herself out of the office and into the hallway and starts yelling and all of the doors open. It's like some comic TV show with my child shrieking. And I was just like, well, I can do this, but the idea that I'm going to be able to be in here in person... (laughs) with this child immobile and the carrier is just not going to fly. 
no, ironically, it's... right, working from home is, is not considered a privilege. It was a necessity for the last 15 months, but yeah. oh, how the world has changed. <laughs> I'm seeing some pockets of resistance of organisations seeking to claw that back, immediate, claw the control back immediately, and yeah. seeing reports in the US in particular around resistance and people being willing to quit rather than lose yep. that flexibility. So I think we're heading... Particularly for the HR folks, we're heading into very interesting times now. I think it's an opportunity to reinvent an organisation if you are thoughtful about it and you take it carefully and in a really considerate way. Couldn't agree more. Yeah.